On this stretch of beach, 1,000 United States Marines died between November 20th and November 24th, 1943. This is Red Beach, Basho Island, Tarawa Atoll, Gilbert Islands, Central Pacific Ocean. In the following minutes, you will return to this legendary battlefield with Marine Corps General David M. Shoup, who led the American forces here in 1943 and was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for Valor. We'll tell the story of how those thousand United States Marines died, and hopefully, and more importantly, why they died. Tarawa, lost in two million square miles of Pacific Ocean. We're aboard a U.S. Marine Corps C-130 aircraft on special mission, returning General David Shute to his battlefield for the final chapter of a story begun 25 years ago. Retired as Commandant of the Marine Corps, he has been brought back to active duty only long enough to dedicate a memorial on Basio Island, Tarawa Atoll. Also returning to Tarawa are five American newsmen who went ashore with the Marines in 1943. William Hipple covered the Pacific War for the Associated Press. Today, he's an airline executive. Sam Schaefer was a Marine Corps combat correspondent then. He's now the chief congressional correspondent in Washington, D.C. for Newsweek magazine. Keith Wheeler represented the Chicago Times. Now he's a staff writer for Life magazine. Richard Johnston was the United Press correspondent in 1943. Now he's executive editor of Sports Illustrated magazine. During the Tarawa invasion, Robert Sherrod worked for Time magazine. His report of this journey will appear in the same publication. Tarawa means divided by the sea, and the islands of Tarawa Atoll are just that. Because Basio Island's wartime airfield no longer exists, we will land on a small coral strip on Bonriki Island to the east and take a launch to the battlefield. The Marines, in November 1943, also arrived by sea. They embarked from Wellington, New Zealand in 16 U.S. Navy transports. The 2nd Marine Division was ready. They had already successfully fought the Japanese at Guadalcanal. Training for the coming operation had been tough, but there had also been moments of happiness for some. 500 men of the division had married New Zealand girls. Many thought of the first lines of a new popular song, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places. At sea, rumors grew wilder with each new arrival to the task force. Three battleships, one heavy and three light cruisers, nine destroyers. Aircraft carriers were also reported joining up. It was going to be a big one. Then intelligence maps appeared and the objective was revealed. Tarawa Atoll in the Gilbert Islands, 2,500 miles southwest of Honolulu, near the equator. Tarawa, 47 small spits of coral and sand. It would be taken by the first fully amphibious invasion in history at a cost that would appall the American public. The main target would be Basio Island, southwesternmost in the chain, where the Japanese had erected fortifications to protect an airfield from which their planes harassed Allied supply lines and blocked penetration toward Japan. The Marines would land inside the lagoon near the pier on beaches designated as Red, One, Two, and Three. Basio must be taken in four days, and the airfield, the basic reason for the invasion, must be operational by that time for American planes to meet a possible Japanese counterforce moving south from the Marshall Islands. Two and one half miles long and only 800 yards wide, about the size of Central Park in New York City, Basio is surrounded on all sides by reefs. 
No one, however, was sure of the exact depth of water over the reefs. If less than four feet of water existed on D-Day morning, the standard Navy LCBP landing craft could not make the shore. The Marines would have to depend on the new LVT amphibious tractors to get them to the beaches. And everyone knew there were not enough LVTs to go around. Intelligence placed Japanese strength on Beisho at 4,800 men from Japan's best fighting units. Their commander had been quoted as saying, the Americans could not take Tarawa with a million men in a hundred years. Beisho, codenamed Helen, had become the most heavily fortified island in the world, defended by dozens of large caliber coastal guns, howitzers, field pieces, tanks, and hundreds of pillboxes, concrete bunkers, and interconnecting bomb-proof shelters. Ammunition for use ashore was carefully loaded. Four million pounds of explosives would be dropped on or hurled at Beisho by Navy planes and ships. A few Marines believed the Japanese would be destroyed by preliminary bombardment. As with all wars, men prayed to something or to someone, for victory or to be spared, or to receive that million-dollar wound through the fleshy part of the leg or arm that would send them, with their manhood intact, back to their brides in New Zealand. The evening before D-Day, Tarawa, Admirals Raymond Spruance and Harry Hill, along with Marine Corps Generals Holland Smith and Julian Smith, were confident of victory. Colonel David Shute, who would lead the assault forces ashore, was confident too. But he thought again in the next morning's early hours of the amount of water that would be necessary to get the standard Navy landing boats over the reef. He thought too of the double apron barbed wire fences that the Japanese had erected between reef and beach and along the beaches themselves, and the concrete tetrahedrons laced with railroad ties constructed on the reef approaches to force landing craft into direct fire lanes. November 20th, 1943. The door to hell was swinging wide, and the Marines had no plan for retreat. And now, a quarter of a century later, General Shoup is returning to Tarawa. Any plane landing on the atoll's tiny coral airstrip is an event. More than 8,000 Gilbertes now inhabit the seven fragmented islands of Tarawa, and the arrival of the Marine Corps' huge C-130 transport has produced a curious crowd. Some remember the four terrifying days in November 1943, when the Americans challenged the defending Japanese garrison, others have heard their parents speak of it. With the exception of the 1941 to 1943 Japanese occupation, the Gilbert Islands have been a British protectorate since 1892. And a representative of Her Majesty's resident commissioner extends the official welcome to General Chu. Today, the islands are a financial headache for Britain. The ever enlarging native population overwhelms a small economy the only a hope appears to be for an invasion of tourists someday. The Gilbertes are getting ready for that possibility. <laughs> Two miles of water separates Bairiki Island from Basho Island. The great dream of the Gilbertes is to complete a causeway linking the two islands. Recently, a New York City-based philanthropic organization, the Foundation for the Peoples of the South Pacific, adopted the project, and preliminary work has begun. During the 30-minute trip across Tarawa Lagoon, General Shoup recalled how the initial U.S. units reached the invasion beaches at Basio the morning of November 20th, 1943. First three waves, referred to as assault waves, in each of the three landing team areas uh, contained 488 men and officers <clears throat> and they did not crunch aground on the reef. Uh, they went for the shore, they were amphibian tractors and the left flank battalion, uh, I think it's a, a truthful statement that every man and officer of those 488 put his feet on something solid when he got out of the tractor, and many of them on dry sand. This resulted from the fact that the destroyer in the lagoon 
uh, continued firing and uh, naval gunfire support to the left flank. And the Japanese uh, thought the naval gunfire bombardment uh, was still going on. What was your own personal experience in getting ashore? How did you reach the beach? Well, I came from a ship in an LCVT to the reef, uh, commandeered the first and one of the few LVTs that were coming back, uh, which had some dead people in it that had to be removed, and then we transferred from the boat to this tractor. At about halfway into the the pier, uh, along the pier, but out in the ocean, uh, our Amtrak driver was killed with uh, machine gun fire and the Amtrak was put out of commission. We then had to uh, unload into the water over our heads and uh, get to the pier. How intense was the Japanese fire at that point? Well, it was intense enough that the little boy who grabbed my hand to go in with me was killed beside me. And before I reached the beach, a mortar had turned me around on my foot, which was fastened in the coral. The results of fire could be seen all along the beach. Uh, and many Marines could be seen uh, from my position that were being hit with rifle fire. Uh, and they fire to the seaward from the uh, dual purpose gun that could fire both anti aircraft and at the boat uh, was pretty fierce. General, a great deal has been written over the years about the Marines, many of them not being able to get all the way ashore because there wasn't enough water over the reefs. Now, we had excellent intelligence in other areas. Why was it that we were not able to know that this would come to pass? Well, I think there's been a great deal of uh, written and a great deal of thinking about that. And much of that has been uh, guessing. We had no uh, understanding or feeling that we could get some LCPBs over the beach, over the reef. Admiral Sprunz's first trip to Wellington told us how many, what the average depth of water was likely to be over the reef, and it was not enough to uh, ensure that LTVPs could get ashore. And that's why uh, at that time the Navy, while they were experimenting and had some plastic boats, they were not available to us. And of course, our operation orders to forces, in effect, the fact that the LVTs. Uh, after depositing their first uh, load of Marines and equipment, would return in their lanes to the reef and shuttle the incoming Marines from the LCVPs that were waiting off the reef back to the shore uh, over the reef. Now, the only difficulty was that we didn't tell the Japanese when they didn't understand that we wanted to get all of our L our, all of our LVTs back for this purpose. and. Uh, they shot a great many of them up that never got to come back. The pier at Facia, the exact area where Shoup and his men waded ashore just after 9 a.m. November 20th, 1943. Marines by the dozens were wounded or killed as Japanese machine gun and rifle fire sought out their figures scrambling over the reef. Today, Gilbertese youngsters stroll or ride bicycles and motor scooters along the rebuilt pier. Very few of them are aware that where they play, Japanese soldiers once crouched, squinting down the barrels of their rifles, waiting for the right moment to kill Americans, and then in turn were killed by other Americans. The men who fought at Tarawa were the best trained to kill in history, and they fulfilled their function.
In November 1943, David Shute crawled ashore at Basio, set up his command post next to a coconut log bunker still occupied by live Japanese, and tried to bring some organization to the scattered Marines pinned down on the beaches. His body already had been penetrated in eight places by shrapnel. During those first hours, it seemed the Marines ashore would be annihilated. Shoup himself would not remember all of the four days which followed. But many of the men who fought with him recall his special mixture of confidence, encouragement, pragmatism, and devotion. Today, so much wreckage remains on Basio, one could believe the battle took place last year, rather than a quarter of a century ago. Dozens of shattered American landing craft and tanks litter the reefs. Huge Japanese 8-inch naval defense guns line the beaches. The steel and concrete Japanese pillboxes, bunkers, and bomb-proof shelters still surrender human remains and live ammunition. What has vanished is Basio's airfield, the American objective in 1943. Groves of palm trees have all but obliterated the outlines of the runway. Thirty feet of beach from water's edge to coconut log seawall, all the foothold most Marines could gain during the first hours of the battle for Tarawa. Hundreds of men were still trying to get ashore from the stranded LCBPs. The LVT tractors tried to form a shuttle service against the Japanese fire. Most Marines decided to take their chances and wade into shore. They passed other Marines on the way out bearing wounded on litters. Some men froze and refused to move forward. Others got up and began the agonizing process of destroying an enemy in fortified positions, some of which were 20 feet deep. A technique quickly developed. Use a flamethrower on the ventilation ports of a bunker, and then use rifles and grenades when the Japanese broke from cover. bodies were probed with machine gun fire to eliminate any fakers who might have ideas of fighting again later. Wounded Marines needed help on every part of the beach, more of them than the medics could handle. Able Marines had to drop off the firing line to help remove the most badly injured. There is no way to define properly the words courage or fear. If there was a man at Tarawa who was not afraid, he was a man without sensibilities. Of the Marines who showed what is known as courage, most will tell you they fought so hard, not because of country, principle, or philosophy, but because their friends were being killed around them, and they wanted that to stop. <laughs> William Hipple was assigned by the Associated Press to write the story of the terrible landings. Together with General Shoup, we discussed Hipple's personal experience. General, when did you uh, first see Bill Hipple? Well, I think uh, on the uh, transport uh, island along with Bill, uh, Bob Sherrod and uh, Mr. Hipple, 
I met them in a casual manner, and I have to say that I didn't spend much time worrying about them or thinking about them because uh, I knew they weren't going to carry a weapon ashore, and uh, uh, so they couldn't be much help to me. When did you next see Bill Hipple? Well, the next time I saw Bill Hipple and Bob Carrot was uh, cutting across a little triangle formed by uh, the Japanese uh, fire, which cut across one side of the um, log hut that I was standing against uh, and the other corner, in which already there were 23 Marines who had, uh, in their effort to get to the command post to deliver messages, uh, ask for instructions, or give reports, had been shot, uh, killed, and wounded in that area. Uh, this, in spite of all my efforts to throw tin and rocks and what have you at them, they still persisted in getting to, sand, uh, to the command post. And I looked up from whatever I was doing for a bit, and here came these two nondescript gents uh, <laughs> heading toward uh, this very uh, desperately dangerous area. And I suppose, uh, thinking of my hog calling days back on the farm, I I really let out uh, with some pretty uh, heavy language and uh, uh, plenty of volume. And I said, uh, ended up with the word, get down. Well, just uh, when, and they did. And when they did, within uh, the fifth of a second, the machine gun spray went completely over the area where they had just been standing. <laughs> Bill, what is your That's reaction of, of that morning or afternoon, I guess it was? What, the first day? Uh, you mean on landing? Yeah. Yeah, I came in right, right back here uh, on, uh, on the Colonel Shoup's command of the 2nd Battalion, 2nd uh, Regiment. And uh, with a, in a, on the Amtrak, previous tractor with uh, Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Herbert R. Amy. Uh, a wonderful guy, as the colonel knows very well, and uh, we had a, a hit in this Amtrak right in the thing, and about killed everybody except about three Marines and myself. And killed Kermit, Colonel. No, colonel Amy uh, was still alive. But we jumped over the side and said, "It looks like you got a story." First thing we knew about the heavy fire, almost, and uh, jumped over, and we started waiting uh, about up to here in the, in the water. And just as we got going, he, uh, I was a few feet from him, he got hit through the head. And I didn't see him again until I saw his body uh, uh, later, in the uh, next day on the beach. The United Press assigned Richard Johnston in 1943 to cover the U.S. invasion of Karawa. As Johnston came ashore with the Marines under heavy Japanese fire, he was an eyewitness to a sequence of destruction which resulted in a Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously awarded. Fred, I came ashore right over here on uh, Red Beach 3 with Major uh, Henry Pearson, Jim Crow's battalion. And we're standing on what? We're standing on what at the time we believed was an enormous Japanese bomb proof. It has since been identified as the uh, Japanese command post. I don't know that that's ever been officially determined. In any case, it's the largest structure on the island, and one that had many, many fire ports and which had heavy fire on our beach. How was it captured by the morning? <clears throat> it was captured on the second day, morning of D plus one, by a rifle companies which attacked the base of it and by a, a platoon of assault engineers led by Lieutenant Alexander Bonnema. He received the Congressional Medal of Honor, did he not? He did indeed. He took his, uh, he took his platoon to the top, planted demolition charges, used flamethrowers on the ventilation ports to flush the Japanese out, and then a heavy Japanese counterattack was mounted from the opposite side. I should say that this whole building was girdled with coconut logs and then flanked by great mountains of sand. So it was possible to scale it by going up the sand at about a 45 degree angle. And that's how Bonnyman came up from the opposite corner over here. And the Marines counterattacked from this direction up over the top and a terrific firefight ensued right here on top. I was able to see this action from the beach about 100 yards away where I was taking all the cover I could find, but I was able to watch this. And Bonnyman led the uh, led the uh, the, re the repulsion of the counterattack, firing his carbine. He shot three Japanese soldiers, with almost at the at the mouth of his rifle, before he himself was shot to death. Keith Wheeler, 
Now a staff writer for Life magazine, was sent to the Tarawa invasion in 1943 by the Chicago Times. He came ashore near several of the 8-inch Japanese shore guns, which during the early stages of the battle had fired upon the American warships and troop transports. Ironically, these guns, manufactured by Vickers in England, and rumored to have been captured by the Japanese at the Battle of Singapore, had actually been sold to Japan by Great Britain long before World War II began. The island looked like it was a smoking wreck. There was hardly a tree standing on it. What was your own personal experience? How did you get to this position from the pier where you landed? Well, I didn't while there was any considerable amount of fighting going on because they were the two forces, the uh, 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, was down here. They had grabbed us, but there was a big separation between them and where Colonel Shoup was. So uh, through the worst of it, we were, most of the correspondents were down in the general area of uh, General Shoup's command post, which, as you've probably seen in pictures, was behind a log black house, yeah. which was full of live Japanese, incidentally. Uh, it was impossible to get through here until uh, things were pretty well quieted down. And part of the six Marines came in on that beach to support the remnants of 3-2 who had got ashore there and had established the beachhead. What's your single strongest reaction or remembrance of the invasion? Having a guy in the hole beside me killed. He was shot. Uh, and uh, we dragged him out of the hole and uh, got him back toward the medics. And I remember, still remember this doctor with, with white uh, sunburn stuff smeared all over his nose and kneeling over this guy. And uh, we were, I don't know, we weren't 50 feet from where the fighting was. And peeling back his eyelid and saying he's gone, take him to the chapel. And, uh, Chaplain was more than 50 yards away, and bulldozer was bulldozing out graves. I took this guy over, got his dog tags, put him away. He was the first lieutenant. I hadn't known him very long. As a matter of fact, I'd probably only known him an hour. A few Marines managed to cross Basio's airstrip. But the overall D-Day situation had grown worse each hour. Of the 5,000 Americans who landed the first day, nearly one-third of them had become casualties. The tragedy enacted on the reefs of Tarawa was all too visible. If the Japanese should counterattack at night, the Marines would be overwhelmed. But the Japanese officers still lacked communication between their units, and the expected bonsai charge did not come. The airfield was still the all-important objective. In the morning of the second day, one of the few American tanks to get ashore began to probe Japanese pillboxes and bunkers at the edge of the strip. the sun climbed higher, the situation worsened. During the night, Japanese soldiers had made their way to wrecked landing craft on the reef and were now sniping at Marines from every direction. Fire from American tanks and mortars was directed from command posts at the new targets. Gradually, the gunners found the range and that Japanese threat was eliminated. Steadily, however, American casualties mounted they were evacuated in any way possible. Medics continually risked their lives to get wounded men to aid. There were very few million dollar wounds. Rather, the Japanese shrapnel gouged out eyeballs and exploded through skulls. Non-discriminating bullets ripped off genitals or tore away vocal cords, cheating victims of even their screams. A steady stream of wounded Marines were lifted into landing craft taken to the transports and winched aboard. To add to the horror, the holds and passageways of the ships began to reek of disinfectant, drying blood, and the moldering smell of the island. Some of the Marines had died while they were being brought to the ships. 
the lives of others ended on the operating tables. There was no choice but to bury them at sea as quickly as possible. While ashore, the tempo of the fighting increased. Sam Schaefer was a Marine Corps combat correspondent during the invasion of Tarawa. He was assigned to record the history of the battle as it was happening. Sam, where did you come ashore? Well, if you look out there, Fred, where the waves are breaking, that's the reef about five to seven hundred yards offshore. And I came in on a Higgins boat and was caught up on the reef. We couldn't move. And we waited for the amphibious tractors to come out and pick us up. Now, you can see a wreck of one right there. The am that was headed for us hit a mine and blew up. We gave up and said, well, we might as well walk ashore. And we did, and I walked the 500 yards or so to the beach, carrying my carbine and my 16-pound typewriter above my head. And I did not realize until after I hit the beach that this 8-inch gun here was still in action. It wasn't knocked out of action until after I hit the beach. Well, where did you move from here, Sam? Then, uh, after resting for uh, an hour or so, we moved right across there and went up along the island. I caught up with the 1st Battalion of the 6th Marines, and it was our uh, task to bottle up the Japanese at the other end of the island. And we did. And this is where they staged their three uh, all-night counterattacks. And many of the Marines, having run out of ammunition, had to kill the Japanese by just throttling them by the neck. It, it was a rather frightful experience. But I must say that the, the Marines' valor was something worth recalling after 25 years. Finally, the Marines took their first prisoners. Of the original 4,836 defenders of Basio, 146 would survive. Only 17 Japanese, the rest Korean laborers. To the Japanese, their own conduct was bravery. To the Marines, it represented fanaticism. The highest ranking survivor was Ensign Kiyoshi Ota of Japan's Sasebo 7th Special Naval Landing Force. From more than 500 bunkers, pillboxes, bomb-proof shelters, and coconut log emplacements, with fanaticism, or with bravery, or with both, the Japanese defenders honored the orders of their commanders and fought to virtual extinction. By the afternoon of the third day, D plus two, Beishio's airfield was under American control. Although bursts of fire from the remaining Japanese bottled up on the eastern end of the island still reached parts of the strip. Heavy equipment was brought ashore, and U.S. Navy CDs went to work on the surface of the field, which purposefully had been spared bombardment from the ships offshore. Within 24 hours, the CBs had completed a rough grading and rolling of the field, and the first U.S. Navy carrier aircraft came in for a landing. It was D-Day plus three. The battle plan had called for the airfield to be in operation on the fourth day of the invasion. The Marines and CBs had kept the schedule. The fate of the second Navy plane to land was only a momentary disappointment. The battle for Tarawa was ended. But in the 110 degree heat, the thick, smoky air drifting across the island carried the heavy, sweet, totally indescribable smell of human bodies decaying in the sun. 4,690 Japanese died on Beisho Island, Tarawa Atoll, along with more than 1,000 Americans. Nearly 2,300 U.S. Marines were wounded. 
and as the flag was being raised, word came ashore that a Japanese submarine had sunk a unit of the Tarawa Task Force, the American Navy aircraft carrier USS Liscombe Bay, with a loss of 644 officers and men. The morning of the dedication of the memorial on Basio Pier, thousands of Gilbertese arrived in launches or outrigger canoes from all the islands of the atoll. Many of them had begun their journeys the night before. New Zealand and Australia sent contingents and a delegation arrived from Japan. The honor guard for the single granite shaft consisted of Gilbertese merchant marine sailors and American sailors from the destroyer USS McMorris anchored in Tarawa Lagoon. General Shoup made the dedication. His honor, the resident commissioner, Members of the great family of human beings, good morning. It is a unique honor for me to participate in this ceremony. I am grateful. The Commandant of the Marine Corps was pleased to send this plaque to be a part of the memorial. Twenty-five years ago, with a matchless courage and devotion, almost 6,000 men sacrificed their lives in their noble efforts to accomplish the duties assigned to them by their respective governments. All served with a high moral purpose and an undaunted vision. The purpose was to win the conflict in which they were engaged. The vision was that of a world at peace. These men departed this life in the belief that they were sacrificing in a war to end all wars and not to build a foundation for World War III. They did not die in test state. Every one of them has will that every one of us and every future generation carry on toward the goal they so valiantly strove for. No more wars. Certainly all of us must often think that it is a sad commentary on 1968 years of so-called civilized progress when the mentality of man has been unable to prevent the continued maiming, killing of the Earth's finest men, women, and children in war. May the spirits of those to whom you are dedicated rise from the sands and the seas and guide all humanity toward the ultimate goal, the elimination of war. And Cenotaph, may you be an ever-present source of encouragement to the living that they may faithfully help in the fulfillment of that prayer of these undying dead of Tarawa. Please, God, May the ships of state of all nations sail on and on in a world forever at peace. After the dedication, I took a walk with General Shoup up Red Beach, the same beach where so many men led their lives away in 1943. General, what was, do you think, the single quality that enabled the Marines to take this island? Well, in the first place, uh, we were close to the Marine Corps birthday. And second place, we had talked a great deal about the fact that uh, this could not, in the hundred and some years of history of the Marine Corps, 
be permitted the, to be the first place where the Marines ever lost. I think that was part of it. And of course the other was the vision and hopes of so many people that landed right in this area. Uh, that after all, uh, they thought, and I thought, that maybe, really, this time, uh, we were doing something that would stop this business of war. And that really, this time, would be the war, the end all war. Well, the question then becomes, did those Marines die in vain? Well, I suppose on the basis of time, and I believe that the final objective, as far as time is concerned, will be attained, uh, that men uh, and governments will finally produce a system where their people can get justice and peace, and therefore produce a peaceful world, I'd say that on that basis, absolutely not. You think then that men are capable of peace, that there is not something in their natures that drive them to conflict? Well, if, if you take history, it appears that perhaps uh, we are uh, throwing uh, small shells against the tide, and uh, people uh, just uh, want to fight, want to kill. But I don't, I don't, personally, I don't take that position. I don't believe that's true. I think that in the end, uh, without a doubt, eventually we will be able to live on this earth where the people can get the, the very meager thing that they want, is justice and peace, and that their, their leaders, their government, will finally rise to an intellectual position in which uh, they can uh, find a way to stop the killing and maiming of men, women, and children in war. That's my faith. How can the United States, given the problems that as a nation we face in the world today, recognizing Soviet Russia as, as a menace to freedom, how can we, given these problems, move more directly toward peace? Well, first I'd like to say that Russia is no more of a menace to freedom in the overall world than they think America is a menace to freedom. Uh, we, we have, and we know today, that, uh, and I think I've said this in some speech, that uh, on the basis of uh, inter and intranational, intranational peace, that today, even today, America and Russia have the power to do it, to prevent war be between nations. And I say, why don't they do it? They have the power to do it. Now, Internation, within the nation itself, I think we're a long way from where we ought to meddle with what happens within the country itself. But international, uh, I think we're now at the place we can, if we can just get the two big powers to say we're going to do it, that there's never going to be any more strife between nations. If you had it to do over again, would you be a Marine? Well, absolutely. I uh, I had an opportunity to be a lot of things besides a Marine, and I had an opportunity for several years to change my mind. And I never changed my mind. And I think uh, as long as uh, a nation has to have a, uh, a military force who can take on any task, uh, that the military uh, commander-in-chief or president uh, needs to be done, I believe that the Marine Corps, uh, for many years to come, will be ready to do it, and I'm proud to have been a part of that organization. David Monroe Chu, born 1904, Covington, Indiana, an American for all seasons. As long as men think of war, as an ultimate game, the challenge of existence, there will be controversy over the Battle of Tarawa. Some will argue the battle was unnecessary in terms of the greater strategy of the war. Others will condemn commanders for not knowing the exact depth of water over the reef, or not waiting until enough of the proper type of landing craft were available. And so on it will go. But really, what matter now? 
the evaluation of the wisdom of military objectives of the past. The historical placing and replacing of responsibility for decisions made or not made. Is it not suffice to say, the men, Japanese and American, who fought at Tarawa did, with uncommon dedication, the best they could to accomplish what they had been sent there to do. Nearly 6,000 men died on a sandy apostrophe in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That fact should provide the only preoccupation. They died because other men, exercising the power of governments, had already decided that killing would be done. They were brought to a time and place where killing was unavoidable. The men who killed and died at Tarawa were left no other choice. Perhaps, too, as General Shoup believes, men died at Tarawa to give the rest of the world still another opportunity to recognize peace and justice as the only really valuable and fulfilling goals for mankind. If not, who answers for the aspirations and dreams destroyed on that island? Who answers for having abrogated the rights of those men to find their own destinies? Who answers for love wasted or not known and for the children who will never be born?